uh, a lot of this comes from the the book called The Happiness Advantage. So what is, like, number one, what is the happiness advantage? Well, he, uh, in the book, they define happiness as the positive emotions uh, that get us a chemical advantage for our lives um, through dopamine, serotonin, uh, that reacts inside our brains. Now, what this does is it helps us organize new information and it keeps that information in our brains for longer <laughs> maybe you didn't know that it has an effect on learning too uh, it allows us to retrieve it faster later on uh, it also helps us make those neural connections it helps us think more creatively it also um, helps us do more problem solving and of course invent new ways of doing things uh, we also, of course, when we're happy, we tend to perceive the world as, around us very differently. When we, we, we actually perceive not just um, th differently, we actually perceive more of the world. Like we perceive more things around our world when, when we are happier. Uh, and so I thought that was a, a very interesting, interesting concept. So I'll tell you about an interesting, uh, when we're talking about the happiness advantage. So this is something like that was a fascinating study for me, uh, was just offering doctors a lollipop prior to a diagnosis. You know, it, the interesting thing in this study was that offering doctors a lollipop before a diagnosis allowed them to come to the correct diagnosis in half the time, half the time of the control group. So there was a group of doctors, no lollipop, and there's a group of doctors with a lollipop. So they come with the correct di diagnosis, so about the same accuracy, but in about half the time. So being happy makes a big, big difference to half the time. Now, how, what are ways that we can increase our happiness? Well, of course, individually, we can uh, do things like prayer, meditation, uh, we can find something that we can look forward to. So something in the future that we're looking forward to. I'm really excited about something that's coming up. Uh, and of course, acts of kindness and positivity uh, in our own surroundings. Uh, and sometimes spending money, right? And so this isn't, I am not saying like, oh, okay, go out and, and, and do a bunch of shopping. But simple things such as uh, going out and spending money on experiences that you have with others can make a big, big difference in terms of your happiness. And of course, when we have certain personal strengths, like things that we're good at, when we exercise those strengths that we have, those skills, those talents that we have, we, we also tend to feel more happy. Uh, and so this is, this is an advantage. <laughs> so this is the, the happiness advantage. All right, so uh, let's go into the next one. This one is referred to as the fulcrum and the lever. Um, so some of you have may have already heard this. Uh, Archimedes said that give me a lever long enough and a fulcrum uh, on which to place it, and I shall move the world. Uh, and what does this mean, like this, this teeter-totter and this fulcrum? Well, the length of the lever is how much positivity we have. So the, the more positivity, the longer it is. And the position on the fulcrum, like whether or not it's hard to move or it's easy to move, is the mindset which we use to generate this power uh, to change. Now, mindset is, is very powerful. Uh, in medicine, placebos are about 55 to 60 percent as effective as most medications like aspirin uh, and codeine for controlling pain. Can you imagine that? Like, you know, at almost like 50 percent as effective. Uh, Japanese researchers, they blindfolded a group of students and they told them that their right arm was being rubbed with a poison ivy plant. And interestingly, all 13 participants in the study reacted with classic symptoms of poison ivy, itching boils and redness, which is not surprising until you find out that the plant that was used for the study actually wasn't poison ivy at all. It was just a harmless shrub. And so our mindset has a huge impact on our how we view the world. Now, and even the smallest tasks can be viewed with greater meaning uh, when they're connected to our own personal goals and values. 
uh, the more that we can align our daily tasks with our personal vision, the more likely we're, we are to see work as a calling. Um, and this is really interesting because this, this week um, I was at, at churches and one of the, the, the mothers who came and spoke with me said, like, my son, he, he's right here. Um, yeah, he, he's enjoying like his uh, coding and robotics class. But, you know, school, he finds school to be really, really boring. And what I said to him was, well, my perspective is that there are no boring tasks, only boring imaginations. And it is our inability to connect what we're learning to our own personal vision, our own personal goals that makes it boring. It, it makes us feel like this is not relevant to us. Why am I learning this at all? And so you're not going to see school as your calling unless you start to see how the stuff you learn in school relates to your goals. And so that is something that is, is very important that covers the, the perspective of like, why is this so, so valuable? Why, why does this make such a big difference? And so what are ways that we can um, leverage this, this mindset stuff? How, how can we improve? What are things that we could do? Practical things we could do to improve our mindset. Well, uh, one activity that was suggested was just take a piece of paper, fold it in half, and then on the left column, you you write down all of the tasks that you just absolutely hate doing. Like you, you hate drawing, I hate mathematics, I hate these things, right? And then on the right, you write down all the things that are your goals as to, well, why do you think you're doing that? And if you, if you write down the reasons on each and you draw arrows between the two, you'll find that it actually can really change your attitude uh, towards these uh, boring tasks. So that's an, that's an interesting one. So I, I like the fulcrum and the lever. That was a fun part of the book. Now, um, the next one I'm going to uh, speak to you about is something called the Tetris effect. Okay, so Tetris effect. What the hell? So um, it was just an example. I think in the in the book, it, the author just refers to it as he was playing Tetris a lot, and then you know he would like walk out uh, in New York or in some like city. I think he was in Boston, uh, and he was just seeing all the buildings as like blocks of Tetris, and it's like oh, wow, how much this this affected. Uh, his his mindset, you know, just like thinking like from that perspective, it can frame like I think it's called framing uh, in other fields, but it is a very important concept. Um, and so referring to the sculptor Pygmalion, um, Pygmalion could just simply look like he was this amazing sculptor. He could just look at a piece of marble and he could see the sculpture that was trapped inside it because he had a vision like of his ideal, like let's say hopes and desires and even the name of the woman who would be uh, carved out of this piece of marble um, when he started. So it, like this, this is what we refer to. Um, and I like this because when our belief in another person's potential tends to bring that person's potential to life, it is called the Pygmalion effect. Uh, and our brain is this okay. So first of all, I gotta I gotta pause a little bit here because this is this is an important important concept. Um, as a as a child, you know, struggling myself with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, I had a hard time in school. I, like school was not easy for me. And what I do remember is that like for some uh, parents, especially like Asian parents, is very common where like, oh, you're not getting the grades, and like they were very disappointed. But I never got that. My parents always believed in my potential, even before I believed it myself. And over time, I ended up believing it too. And that totally changed my perspective on everything related to education. It's why I work in education. It's why I'm running for trustee. It's why I've been doing this field for 15 years. It is, it is my why. It is my why for education. <clears throat> and so 
I love this, you know, and and why I refer to it is I didn't even know about the Pygmalion effect. But it's true. Studies have shown that if you believe in someone before they even believe in themselves, they will adopt this belief and you can totally change as an educator or as a parent, you can totally change the direction of that child's future. All it takes is a little bit of faith. A little bit of faith in those students can make a world, world of difference. <clears throat> you know, the reality is, you know, people say like, oh, I'm just going to learn everything on, on YouTube. I'm just going to go watch a bunch of videos. <laughs> oh, man. Hold on. You know, our brain is this amazing spam filter. Uh, the scientists estimate that we only remember one out of every hundred pieces of information that we receive. Now, when our brains constantly scan for focus and they focus on the positive things in our lives, of course, we, we grow in our own happiness. We grow in gratitude and we grow in optimism. Uh, so for example, and this is a great example for you to try at home if you want to see how I'm going to apply this, is go and write down three good things each day for a whole week. Studies have shown that people who do this are less depressed at the one-month interval, the six-month follow-ups. This doesn't mean we need to be blind to everything that's bad in our world and in our lives. But we need to have a realistic and reasonable and healthy sense of optimism. We can use positivity uh, to help us see what is really going on in the world. And so this exercise, just write it down. <laughs> write down a few examples makes a huge difference. Because when you write down those examples, like just, just for a week, like just try it, one week, see what happens, you'll find that what did you have to do in order to write positive things? Like one thing I, I really try to do with my own children before every single meal, I ask them to say one thing, one thing that they are thankful for. What are they thankful for? Yes, we can say like, yeah, I'm thankful for like my video games. I'm thankful for TV. Okay. Right. But what would you like to thank God for? <laughs> And over time, they, they get used to it. They get used to me communicating that there is an expectation that you're going to have to find something to be thankful for every single day. So if you can imagine, like, you're, you're my kid, then what's happening in your mind is like, oh, i got to look for something that, that's positive. i got to look for something that I'm thankful for every single day. Mission accomplished, right? You're, you're changing their thought patterns. You're changing their attitudes. This is wonderful. This is what we want. So I think that this is a, a positive, positive thing. <laughs> and so, uh, again, like some really great, uh, great thoughts here. Okay, so let's move on to the next one. Uh, and this one's called failed, uh, Fail Forward. So it's about what Fail Forward means, and I think he calls it something different in the book. I think he calls it like fall up. Um, he calls it, it's about capitalizing on the downs so that you can build upward momentum. Uh, and of course, after every single crisis or adversity, there are three different paths we can take. One is no change, right? Nothing's going to change in our lives. The second is we focus on the negative and things get worse. Or the third is we focus on the positive and this leads to growth. So, after the March 2004 train bombings in Madrid, uh, psychologists found that residents who experienced post-traumatic growth, right? You think this is such a terrible, horrible experience, but they experienced growth. That is, they had enhanced personal strength. They had more self-confidence. They had a heightened appreciation and uh, for and, and greater intimacy in their own social relationships. And, and they also had increases in spirituality uh, and compassion for others. They had better openness and even better overall life 
satisfaction. So what determines the path is really how they conceived of the, the cards that they had been dealt. Some saw it as a blessing that they're still alive. And that means that they're being called to enjoy every moment, while others saw it as a tragedy, something that they couldn't control. Early failure is often the fuel for the very best ideas. And these are the, the ideas that eventually transform industries, they make record profits, and they even reinvent people's careers and their lives. Uh, for example, like Michael Jordan was cut from his high school basketball team. Walt Disney was fired by a newspaper editor for being not creative enough. Can you imagine Walt Disney not creative enough? The Beatles were turned away by all the record executives who told them that guitar groups are on their way out. Guitar groups on their way out. Crazy. You know, I, I have a personal experience with this. I like uh, My experience with chemistry in university was like this. Um, in my first uh, like semester as a major, uh, I had broken more glassware than I had paid in tuition. I was so afraid. I was so like I was, I was so crippled by fear. This totally impacted my mindset, and it made me less uh, likely to experiment and to enjoy all of the creativity that exists in chemistry. Uh, and of course, it also led me to take computer science. Uh, as a field that I perceived to as a safe place to like you make mistakes with very little consequence, and I think that this is this is why um, that environment, that mindset, everything is so so important because that type of those small things like ah oh, like I've got that mindset that we were talking about the uh, the the fulcrum right so there is the the length and then there's the the point like the teeter totter point why is this important is important because it, it that mindset changes everything now i hope that makes sense the next one i'm going to refer to is and something i i've i've spoken about several times is uh, focus on the the small goals not the big one not the like the oh in my life i want to have this and this legacy no focus on the what is that first step, right? Um, oh, there's that that famous saying that you know the the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. What is that step? Understand that step. And there's a, another example that I I loved. Like some of you maybe have you have you seen the the movie Zorro, uh, the the Mask of Zorro. So in the Mask of Zorro. Um, a young and impetuous Alejandro has a quest to right the injustices of our world, of the world. He wants to do all of this immediately and spectacularly. Uh, and then the higher he flies, well, the farther he falls. And soon he feels completely out of control and utterly powerless. And by the time that the aging swordmaster Don Diego <laughs> has a meeting with Alejandro, he's a broken man, a slave to drinking and despair. He promises Alejandro that mastery will come uh, with dedication and time. And he begins Alejandro's training by drawing a circle with his sword in the dirt. And hour after hour, Alejandro is forced to fight only within the circle. As Don Diego says, you know, this circle will be your world, your whole life. And until I tell you otherwise, there is nothing outside of it, just the circle. Now, of course, once Alejandro masters control of the small circle, Don Diego allows him to try greater and greater feats, which one by one he achieves. But none of those achievements would have ever been possible 
had you not first learned to master that small circle? And before that moment, Alejandro had no command over his own emotions. He had no sense of like his own skill, no faith in his real ability uh, to accomplish like a goal. And worst of all, he had no feeling of control with his own feet. <laughs> Only after the he first mastered that circle, like that first circle, then then does he really start to become Zorro the legend. And I love this story so, so much because it relates uh, so much to uh, another book that I have included in the live stream called The One Thing. Um, and I, I like The One Thing because it talks about like there are small, it, it's the small habits that you have over a long period of time that, that changes everything in people's lives. And if we can build those habits young, like we, it's just like success is really just a matter of time. That makes sense. So the next is about habits. We're going to talk a little bit about habits. How do you turn like bad habits into good ones? Can we can we do that personally? Like, is there something that we can quickly do to to turn bad habits into good ones? Would you like to know that? <laughs> well, here we go. We're uh, people say that we're merely bundles of habits. Like that's who we are. Uh, and what, I like the book, uh, The One Thing, because it helps explain uh, this concept like very clearly. Uh, what is the one thing that you can do that will make everything else in your life easier? What's the one thing that you can do? Now, the reality is our willpower depletes uh, throughout our day. Um, so that's why it's important to get your one thing done first in the morning. So, for example... Uh, by moving the TV remote upstairs and keeping the books near the living room where you would normally watch TV, like just the adding those like those, those tiny little twenty seconds um, to your to your task, like it can gain you back three hours, you know, of just sitting there and and watching TV, being sedated. Um, so this parent was asking me, um, like, when is the right time to expose my kids? to any devices. And I asked them, well, when is the right time for them to be creative? Uh, and the reason I mentioned this was because this is interesting to me uh, because even the Pediatrics Association, um, they say like, they used to say no screen time before three years of age. But what happened? They changed their mind. They said, well, if it's Skyping with the grandparents, it's fine, right? That's good for them. And so my approach has always been, well, what are you using the devices for? Are you using them for sedation? Are you using them for relating? Are they using it for creating? That matters. And so when we spend our time understanding uh, how they're actually using it, that's very important. Now, another thing that I, I don't know if people have considered is that um, something simple as sleeping in your gym clothes, it makes it easier for you to do exercise in the morning. Like, so when you wake up, you're you're set to go. Like, I'm already in my gym clothes, right? So if you wanted to exercise, it's just like removing all those barriers reduces the amount of willpower that is required to achieve your one thing, your one goal. And so it is very important to look at what are the barriers. Is it just like we, we bought an exercise machine and we thought, well, do we put it in the living room or do we put it, you know, in the basement? And, and we're like, well, those few steps that you have to the basement could be enough to stop you from using it all together. So that's something that's very important to consider.